KITCO News, special coverage of the Decentral Miami Conference is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management. We're here in Miami at the Decentral Conference and this is an amazing event full of energy. We're here with a very bright developer. He works for Project Serum. His name is Jay. Jay, welcome to Kiko, man. Thank you. Nice Good to be to here. See you. Yeah, you had a very cool background. You worked for, uh, well, you worked for the same company as Sam Beckman Fried, who I've talked to last uh, last week. And then before that, you were a developer at Google, right? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you basically evolved from Google into the current role that you have now. Yeah, for sure. So I start. Yeah, like you said, I started out my career at Google. I was working on like applied machine learning stuff there at YouTube. Um, that was great and all, but yeah, I got really interested in blockchain and found out about Alameda Research and just decided to take the jump there. Uh, yeah, from there I joined Alameda Research and I was working um, as an engineer on the trading systems there, um, working on you know both centralized exchange stuff but also decentralized exchange trading and DeFi yield farming stuff like that. Um, and from there, found about Serum and decided to jump. jump Jay, we're going to talk about Solana today, but before I move into that. Um, I want to just get your take on Bitcoin. You and I had a panel earlier, and uh, I think I asked you the question, where I asked the question to the panelists, uh, what can supplant Bitcoin as a store of value? And your answer was quite interesting. It, you said that there's a lot of other tokens or projects that have more utility. I'm going to take that argument to one more level of extreme here. Some people have said that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value at all because it doesn't do anything. It has no utility. So should the Bitcoin price be zero? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, there are things that came before Bitcoin that, that may, might be in a similar position, like, you know, some say gold, and those things are obviously very valuable now. So I think um, that doesn't necessarily mean the Bitcoin price should be zero. Um, also, I do want to add, yeah, I know we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but one interesting thing about Bitcoin that someone told me a while back that I think I agree with is that um, no matter which blockchain ends up winning, right? Um, Bitcoin, I think, will always be one of the fastest tokens to transact and one of the cheapest because whatever blockchain that is that does win or whatever set of blockchains that win, um, those will likely have some way of bridging Bitcoin to those blockchains. Um, and you can't say the same thing will be true about any other token. That's not because those applications are built on Bitcoin, right? It's just because of how big it is? Yeah, it's just because, you know, Bitcoin is so big and so well adopted now that I think any blockchain um, that comes about will likely have a bit bridge from Bitcoin to that blockchain. Let me just get right into it then. Solana, can Solana be the next Bitcoin? Um, I think First of all, sorry, let's <laughs> back up a bit. For the viewers who may not understand the protocol, what is Solana? Yeah, so Solana is a layer one uh, blockchain. Um, it's highly scalable, um, cheap, fast to transact, um, and has a bunch of you know interesting scalability um, features that, that it implements. Okay, and what's special about this? I mean, that sounds like a lot of different things. For sure, yeah. I think um, there's there's a bunch of different things that it implements that you know you can compare and contrast against blockchains like Ethereum. One thing I do want to mention um, is that it's highly parallelized, and so transactions on the Solana blockchain can occur in parallel. Um, and so that's like one of the key features that I'm super excited about. Um, another thing is that it scales with the um, scaling uh, of hardware in the real world. Yeah. And I think that's one super interesting thing that Solana yeah. also... You probably get asked this question to death, but Solana versus Ethereum, <laughs> pros and cons. For sure, yeah. I think, um, you know, Solana obviously right now is a lot cheaper and a lot faster. Um, one thing that a lot of people do say is Ethereum is more decentralized. I think right now that is true. And Solana is making a lot of improvements, you know, growing the node count of the network and, and other things to get it to that point. And I think in the far future, it, it can reach that level of decentralization. Well, you well. have an engineering background and a quant trading background. So I think this next question you might be able, to be, be able to answer quite well. When people are evaluating projects for either trading or an investment, what are some of the criteria they should be looking for? And you can, you know, you can talk about Solana, use examples there, for example. For sure, yeah. I think I'm more on the engineering side, and so I can speak more about that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, Solana is super interesting as an engineer. Um, one interesting thing about it is it's, it's or the primary programming language that um, developers use to develop smart contracts on Solana is Rust. And this is, um, you know, I think developers, most of them would prefer that over Solidity. It is a little bit harder to learn initially, but it has a lot of cool properties. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're really developing on the blockchain at the base level. You know, Solidity sits on top of the EVM and, um, 
you know, there, there are pros and cons there, but I think, you know, Rust, it, it sits at that bottom level. And so you have full control over what's going on as if you're you know, programming in sort of an embedded environment. And what does that mean for us, layer two developers? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are no la layer twos to my knowledge on top of Solana yet. You know, Solana is a layer one, just like Ethereum. Right. Um, but I, I do think there's like uh, some potential there for, you know, in the far future, you know, eventually Solana block space will be, um, you know, heavily contested on the layer one. Yeah. And there will need to be scaling solutions just like Ethereum. You know, maybe not just yet because Solana does have that capacity. But eventually, you know, I could imagine, you know, ZK rollups and other things on Solana. Why are some applications switching from um, Ethereum to Solana as a base layer? Yeah, I think Solana has a lot of scalability built into the L1 itself, which, you know, Ethereum is now already looking to work with, you know, these different kinds of rollups. Um, and that enables, you know, better composability and better UX for the user. Um, and also just, you know, faster and cheaper user experience as well. So going back to my question about picking investments at large, as an engineer, you're evaluating your project. What are some of the characteristics of a project that make it stand out to you and say, you know what, that thing has potential for growth. Um, we talk about adoptability, mass adoption is something that is important. What are some things that make something, uh, what are some profiles that make a project worth considering we're looking at mass adoption. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, at Alameda Research, I, I do quite a bit of ventures, you know, speaking with the uh, early protocols in Solana that would like investment from Alameda. And one of the core things I look at, you know, in, in addition to, you know, the general sort of Silicon Valley model of looking at the founder rather than necessarily the idea and stuff like that, um, we definitely look for long-term long sustainability in the protocol, making sure that the protocol can generate fees for itself. Um, and in that way, um, you know, can justify its own price. Going what do you mean by term. generate fees for itself? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, maybe the best example or the best um, two protocols to look at in this regard are Uniswap and SushiSwap. So Uniswap, of course, it has its fees, right? But those fees go entirely to the LP. So the Uniswap Uni token actually doesn't generate fees for the Uni token holders. It's primarily just the governance token. Whereas on the other hand, the Sushi token does generate fees and those get... Um, brought over to the Sushi token holders via the ex-Sushi staking model. Um, and I think, you know, Uni in the future could implement something similar, and I think we'd be uh, super excited to see what that looks like. But right now, we're, we're very bullish on, on the kind of model where, um, you know, the, the token holders do receive some kind of value. Well, when there is more adoption, do you think fees, I'm talking about gas fees now, do you think gas fees will be even higher once we have higher levels of adoption? Yeah, definitely. So right now on Solana, there's like a set gas fee. I think there is some sort of mechanism to adjust that when there's a huge amount of load. On is that the something that worries network? you? I mean, I, I, um, on the but, one hand, that on the one hand, you want more people to use yeah. Solana. On the other hand, it might be more expensive to use it. Is that a problem? Yeah, right now I think it's very crude. If I recall correctly, it's like the gas fee gets doubled when a certain amount of usage is is occurring on the blockchain. Yeah. I think in the future, um, it would be interesting to see what like a uh, gas auction model on Solana looks like. Right now, it's like you know very low, and um, it doesn't it doesn't scale necessarily with the with the amount of usage on the network, unlike Ethereum. So it'd be interesting to see what that looks like, um, and I think eventually, you know, like I said, Solana block block space will be contested in the future, and so something like that needs to happen. Look, you're an engineer. If you were working on ETH 2.0, what would you do to uh, reduce the gas fees? Um, yeah, I think you know the or the Solana question, for that matter. Yeah. Um, well, Solana gas fees are already super low, and so I think... Um, Make it lower, EJ. Make uh, it lower for us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, going back to what we discussed earlier, there could be these kinds of roll-ups on Solana, and um, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone working on it right now, but I think that would be the way forward to make it lower. Um, in terms of ETH, I think, you know, given the backstory of ETH, um, you know, they have that base to work on, and they sort of have to take that and, and innovate. You know, it would be weird for them to just, you know, rip out the EVM and start from scratch. So, you know, given what they're, what they're working with now, I think, you know, they're, they're on the right track and they're, you know, they, they know their, their blockchain better than I do. And I think, you know, they're doing, you know, Vitalik is obviously brilliant and, and doing all the right things there. You have a machine learning background from your Google days. I'm just curious to know how that space is being applied to blockchain. Yeah, for sure. I think it's super interesting. Um, you know, in Solana, there's a lot of teams working on um, surfacing data that can be used for these kinds of insights. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out to, for example, Vibe Network, SoFun, um, the graph also with their sub team streaming fast is working on 
data analytics on Chain Crunch as well. There are all these teams building data analytics on Solana, and these are something that, you know, as Serum being a decentralized exchange, we're super excited about, right. and seeing how they can surface data, and then people can build machine learning applications on top of that. Okay. So, and what are those applications? Build insights on top. What are those applications aiming to fix or improve on? Yeah, I think um, there's a, a lot of interesting uh, data that can, in insights that can be. Um, found based on on-chain activity. We see that on Ethereum right now with Nansen, Nansen.ai. Um, and I think something similar like that can exist on Solana. Just surface, you know, different types of activity. You know, Alameda Research is a heavy user of Nansen. And I think, um, you know, Alameda would be super excited to see something like that on Solana. Just seeing the movement of different tokens, even NFTs and other things like that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you think one day a computer with advanced enough AI could just create its own token and solve all the problems we talked about? Um, yeah, I think it's super exciting, you know, the the like sort of AGI space and how that relates to blockchain and Web3 and decentralization. Um, I think right now they're very much so still sort of two divorced fields, you know, the, the work that like, um, the people working on supercomputers like OpenAI and, and other teams, uh, I'm not sure how much um, collaboration there is between them and, and Web3 and blockchain, yeah. but I do think, you know, eventually all these, all these technologies um, that are springing up more recently will will sort of come together, and, and, and I'm I'm super excited to see what like those that kind of collaboration might look like. Well, finally, what are the most exciting developments that you see in the DeFi space right now? Um, yeah, definitely. I think I'm super excited. Um, yeah, one of the things I'm super excited about is protocol owned liquidity. I think this is um, it's where the protocol itself can own its own liquidity. So, for example, the the Uni token holders, right? They they're governing the uni protocol and and this means you know they govern you know the fee models of uni and and the overall direction of, of the product but they can also you know you can imagine they, they can govern actual uni lp tokens so they can use um or or rather you know in some way either by using the uni token treasury to acquire uni lp tokens or, or some other method they can acquire these lp tokens so they can just own it for themselves and that way no matter what happens on the protocol there's always going to be a base level of liquidity that exists on uni or Uniswap that's owned by the Uni token holders. And how does Project Serum fit into all this? Yeah, it's actually something we're uh, on the right now. You know, we're we're, we're exploring right now um, and thinking about how how we might do that. There are no LP tokens on on Project Serum at least natively because it is a central limit order book rather than AMM. But there are projects that are building AMM like functionality on top of Serum, um, and we're you know looking into collaborating with them on how the Serum DAO can maybe own its own liquidity as well. Yeah, cool, man. Listen, awesome speaking with you. I learned a lot. Thanks for coming on the show, Jay. Yeah, you as well, David. It's yeah. super awesome to be here. Thank you for watching Kitco News. Stay tuned for more. Kitco News, special coverage of the Decentral Miami Conference is brought to you by Cook Finance, a revolution in DeFi asset management.